Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about how do you integrate two vocabularies together. Now this is sort of a companion video to one of my last videos I did. I will link it up above if you did not catch that, where I walk through how you can use a hypergraph or a data fabric to actually do some of this mapping between different data. Now, today we're not going to be talking about just any data. We are going to be talking about controlled vocabularies. So in this case, we are going to be assessing two different controlled vocabularies, both of which are from the aerospace sector. So one is more of a general vocabulary for transportation, while the other is very strictly for aerospace. So today we're going to be walking through the 10 steps that I take while I am integrating two taxonomies together, I'm going to be putting some explainer text and some examples up here on the screen. And when we get to the actual, how do you decide and how do you actually do some of that mapping, I'm actually going to show you a little clip of how I actually did that. All right, so let's start with number one, which is just a survey of the products, the use case, the content, and the vocabulary themselves. So this is understanding what is the current state. And the next step after that is, and what's the desired state after that? Because if you are bringing two vocabularies together, it most likely means that you are doing some kind of merger or acquisition. Again, see the last video on how I talk about that um, with other data outside of control vocabularies. And this also maybe happens if you are acquiring just content, maybe not the whole company, but you're getting their content, or maybe you're just aggregating some other content. These are all things that you can use for all of those different use cases. So on step number two, what product line is this going to be supporting? So you might just be integrating these so that you can do an aggregated search over all the content. That's a very common use case or doing BI analytics across the different data sets, you know, that sort of thing. So those would be your products or those are your use cases. Now you can integrate them both so that they basically make one new vocabulary, but uh, this process I'm going to walk through with you today, it's going to be a, a healthier way of doing that than just shoving them together. I've been on projects where that's happened and that doesn't work very well. And here's the reason. Remember that survey that we just did of the data in step one? Here's where that's going to be incredibly important. What level of indexing or what level are these subjects at? So there's categories, which are broad level buckets of things, which you would see more in like a browse taxonomy on e-commerce, or is this more going to be like a search query expansion, recommendation engine kind of taxonomy? And I'm saying taxonomy, but I really just mean control vocabularies in general, but in the use case we're going over today, these are taxonomies. So you do really want to be careful about this because in this situation, the vocabulary we were going to be consuming was a category browsable vocabulary and the vocabulary we're mapping it to, which is the one that we're going to keep, that one is for query expansion and recommendations. So they are two different levels. So you can see why if you tried to shove those two together um, without doing a lot of other analysis or uh, more thought into how you're doing that, it's not gonna end very well. You're just going to have some very big chunky subjects in an otherwise very granular and specific vocabulary. You also want to make sure that there's no circular logic. If these are very large vocabularies, sometimes if, if both of them are granular, they could have a child term of a child term that somehow is a broader term of a different child term. So you get like these weird circular logic things. That's not good for machine learning. And honestly, it's not very good for your user experience either. So just be aware of that while you're going through this. What format is this thing in? Um, that's going to be helpful for the remaining steps, especially if you are using any machine learning, which I am gonna go over some of those approaches here. This also goes into how are you actually going to be doing this mapping? Because you could do it by hand and you might want to do some of that just to do some testing and see what the uh, matching looks like. But uh, using machine learning methods is much preferred when you're doing this. And when we get into the later steps, we're actually using some of the machine learning approaches 
So one thing to keep in mind as you're going through this exercise, you don't need to map the entire vocabulary all at once. Uh, I would actually say that you probably want to do a small POC or a small spike or however you define that in your organization to just test the waters and understand first, what does this vocabulary, sometimes you just got to feel the data and, and kind of play around with it to, to really understand it. Um, or have some time to go back and forth with the content providers or the um, company that you are acquiring so that you actually understand what they're doing with their vocabulary. And if you need to get additional information, you can do so. So make sure you start small and then grow out as you develop not only your understanding, but the process that we're going through right now. Get that under your belt before you do the whole kin caboodle because you're always going to find exceptions. Do not doubt you will find exceptions to everything I'm talking about here. And that's okay. But you need to be prepared for that. And you need to get, you know, kind of the best case scenario under your belt so that when you do see those um outside of the norm um, things, then you kind of can have a better strategy because you already have the base already figured out. Again, feeding into the, how do you get better machine learning when you're doing this? And if you're doing it by hand, this is also something that's going to add to that context, right? Because if you're just looking at the string of a, a label in a vocabulary, you may not realize what it actually means until you one, see it assigned to content or, and this is what this step is focused on, it has metadata associated with it. Does it have a scope note? Does it have a definition? And how are they using those two pieces of metadata? If you see scope notes and definitions, really look at them because very, very often the same vocabulary could be intermixing what those two things mean. So a scope note traditionally means from either a machine learning indexing perspective or from a human indexing perspective, how should someone interpret what they read to then assign that tag? That's not always what people use it for. Sometimes they mix it up with definition, where a definition is describing what is this thing doesn't tell you how to index with it. It just tells you what is this thing. Back into that whole data mesh, you know, data-driven design is understanding better how others are using that. And that doesn't mean you have to use it that way, but it gives you an insight on how they were using it. Okay, so what we're going to do first is start to understand how the incoming company, the aerospace company, has assigned taxonomy to their content. Now we already know that it's used for categorization, not classification. So it's used for browsing instead of actually doing a, a deep search on something. So what that means to me is they're using a lot of the, the abstract and even full text of these articles to help the search engine find them, not necessarily the controlled tags. So when I'm looking at the taxonomy itself, I can look at this um, by hand, and, and we're going to kind of walk through that by hand, but I'll just tell you what I usually do is I actually take this content and I throw it through my machine learning uh, auto classification that I would use for my taxonomy, and I see what it comes out with. Uh, so that gives me a clue as to how, like, which taxonomy terms I have that would match up to this. Now, we're doing this at a small testing level, so it's not going to be a ton of documents. It's not going to take you forever. It's not going to be too costly to do this. The other thing that that helps with is my machine learning algorithm also spits out suggested terms. So here you're not going to see the, the F score or anything like that. Um, and this is obviously in Excel because I just wanted it to be something human readable so that I could... Again, using that domain-driven design, I want to share my findings with the incoming company because we're being uh, integrated. We're not doing a hostile takeover. So we want to make sure that we are still honoring the needs of their products uh, while also being able to integrate it into the larger systems and be able to you know, search on it on either platform. So here you're seeing drill bits because that's coming from this article's full text and abstract, and you're also seeing imaging techniques. Now you can see imaging techniques and imaging. So, well, this one has a unique ID, which means this is one of the control terms from the taxonomy. Cool, 
Is this more specific? Again, if I had the F scores on this screen, you'd be able to tell. This is actually pretty low. I think it was like 23.23, so pretty low. And then this had a higher confidence. So what I can say is, yeah, get rid of this. And you can do that by just setting a threshold to say anything under a certain percentage uh, just gets thrown out. But what this helps me with is understanding if I continued to index this content, what terms would I actually need to add to my taxonomy if I start to index it at a deeper level? Because what I see here is I already have terms that are going to be general enough to help with this uh, high level categorization. Uh, but this gives me a clue as to, okay, if I wanna go deeper, what's the level of effort to do that? And you have to figure out which use case is that for. So with categorization browsing, um, on the original website, you don't need that. They they seem to have um, perfectly you know satisfied customers, um, but on my site, I have people that are using those those subjects and those tags to be able to deep deep dive into the content. So for my use case, I might actually need to go a step farther and have these. Now, if you're going to keep that categorization on the original site, that's totally acceptable. You do you. Um, and the way that you would do that though is these, right? And we're talking about the, that hypergraph. Um, you would have these rolling up into larger domains, right? So we have a hierarchy for our taxonomy. So these all would roll up into a higher category that you would then map this category to whichever category these are from. So that when the machine sees these tags, it knows to put it underneath this category when it's on the original site. So you can add in some of those rules and those logics uh, so that the, the two systems still can operate. All right, so the next thing this is gonna help me with is understanding economy term from the aerospace side is going to map to this larger uh, transportation vocabulary. And it's not going to be apples to apples, right? Like this isn't going to do all the mapping for you for sure, but it's going to give you a better idea and, and you're going to be able to knock out the easiest ones. So for instance, um, so let's say materials and, and coatings always, always, always uh, maps to maybe these taxonomy terms. Great. We don't have to worry about doing any additional work on that. And we're going to map those um, together in, in our graph and say the broader term of these means the same thing as this, which is actually what I would do because, again, these are more specific. And in the categorization side, they don't have them, um, and which is fine because these map to a broader term and that broader term would more likely map to, to this. And I do know that in this taxonomy, the broader term, so you see these all start with 400, that 400 or anything that started with a 400 was from materials. So that is probably a better match to this. So that's why having a hierarchy in your taxonomy is super important when you're doing these kind of mapping exercises. So as you go along, you're going to start to see a picture emerge on how these terms and these terms map together. You're also going to start to pick up all of those additional terms you might need to think about adding to your taxonomy. Now, do not add things to your taxonomy just because you're seeing it in a sample. You're going to want to do a larger auto classification exercise to see if these start to pop up more because you wanna have a threshold of how much content you have to support adding a new taxonomy term. That's a very important rule for taxonomy creation that I don't hear many people talk about. So it's not a, taxonomy should not be let's collect them all. Like if there's so many different types of paraffins, if the only thing people talk about is a general paraffins, that's all you need for your taxonomy from your content. Uh, your content should always be your guide. Okay, so once you have this, you have a better understanding of the actual mapping. So let's go to the actual taxonomy mapping now because we have an idea of what maps to what. So what you're seeing here are the broad level and then the more specific levels that these uh, are our content classification exercise raised. So what we're seeing here is the broad term, the actual subject that was connected to that broad term, 
We're seeing the variance, and this is from the full text, because remember, we did that um, you know, suggested term exercise with our, our content to see what other terms we might need to add. And then over here, we have the possible match. And this is from the uh, taxonomy that is currently being assigned to that content. So the way that you would go about doing this is you would, in your graph, say, okay, these are all terms that mean regenerative breaking. And you're doing that because our taxonomy, right, the transportation taxonomy is going to be our source vocabulary that we're going to continue to use and grow. And so what you're doing is you're going to be mapping these as, as nodes to this hypernode, right? Because we're thinking if we get more acquisitions, we're going to always be mapping to our vocabulary. Now, sometimes the, the, the target vocabulary is going to have terms that we don't have, right? And that's where you're going to go through and you're going to check your, your, your corpus of in your volume of content across both companies to see if there's merit to adding that vocabulary term or, and it's totally fine if, if you don't have a, a larger use case for it, because again, domain-driven design using that data mesh uh, principles, you would then just leave it as its own node in the, uh, the target systems if they wanna continue using it or if that's not an option, you would then bring it into your system and add that as a hypernode by itself with the understanding that you will eventually be able to map more terms uh, across the two companies to that hypernode, or eventually you have that data governance where you're like, hey, you know, this hypernode has existed for two years and we still don't really use it very much. So what do we want to do with it? And then you make a decision on it. You'll also see while I'm doing this, there are terms that I'm highlighting. And so what I'm doing when I'm doing this is these are terms that I know from my own work uh, in our suggested term list for the transportation taxonomy that these are already suggested terms. Well, that's great. So now we have even more evidence to add this to our vocabulary. And so what you would see on, in, in your hypergraph is High voltage systems would be the preferred term, the hyper term, the hyper node. This term, power supplies, which is from the incoming vocabulary, that would be added as um, a, a node that means in our system, high voltage system. And then you could add these either as synonyms to high voltage systems or and especially if these came from the incoming content, uh, more so than our own content, you could also add these as um, nodes on their own that just say something like natural language term if it's from a search log or um, suggested term. So you're gonna go through and you're gonna do that for the whole taxonomy. Now, you might be saying, wow, Ashley, that's fine if you have a small vocabulary, but how do I do that for a very large vocabulary? Well, there again is where the original step that we did with the content is so important because you can actually use the findings from this to automatically generate those mappings, right? Because your taxonomy, it has a hierarchy. So you would just say, okay, you know, machine mapping tool. Um, I'm going to write a script to say the, you know, if three terms are added and they all are from the same broader category, that category maps to this category. Or I could say, you know, make another rule. If uh, there's two different categories, maybe uh, the higher F score is the one that gets mapped. And you're also going to get those, those suggested terms. And you can just add those automatically in your mapping process, if you're doing this in an automated way, um, as synonyms of the, the category that you have uh, for these, or you could add it as synonyms to this category. Now I'm saying either or, there's a lot of decisions that you have to make as you're going through your taxonomy mapping. And that's why the steps that we went over 
before this step are so incredibly important. I think a lot of people, they're just like, give me the data. I want to see the data. I can start mapping these things together. Yeah, you could do that. Um, but you're not thinking in a domain driven way. So you're going to be basically taking your domain or your product or your company's logic on indexing and you're just going to force it onto that other company and their systems and and their customers, which are not used to it, right? So it doesn't mean one is better than the other. It does mean that for a while, and you have to decide you know, when the cutoff is, you need to get your customers used to the new way that you want to do things if you decide to do it in a new way because remember the this other company they've got customers they've got revenue they've they the things are working well maybe if they're not working well that's a different story so do you really need to to mess with the way they're doing things or do you just need to be able to use that data at the larger level across both companies when you're doing some of your hypergraph work so that a search an aggregated search on both systems is going to work well that's what you have to decide in those those original uh, steps that we went over. A few other tips when you're actually doing the taxonomy mapping is there are standards out there to give you some terminology. You know, you, you've heard me say target and source, and this is a, a partial match or this is an exact match, those types of things. Uh, that comes from a standard. It's ISO 25964 uh, part one. And if you're doing multilingual part two, uh, so there are standards out there that you can use. Now, they don't tell you exactly how to make those determinations. So a lot of the decision making that we just went over, you still have to figure those things out. You know, that standard, by the way, is pretty expensive. So um, I just want to let you know that it is very helpful to read if you've never done work like this before, but it's not going to tell you step by step how to do it. Um, that's what this video is hopefully going to help you with. I can't do it step by step with you, but hopefully you can see how I've done it. So that will help you too. The other thing is um, when you're doing the mapping, if you don't have some of that machine learning stuff to, to bank on, you can also use some linked data to help you. So for instance, if you are mapping between two different medical vocabularies, there are a ton of open source, like UMLS is a good example. You can go to UMLS and figure out, okay, I'm using um, RxNorm vocabulary and the incoming content is actually using mesh. How do I map those together? It's already been done for you with linked data. So go check out UMLS or even BioPortal it has some uh, mappings between vocabularies that you can use. So if you're using things that are, are um, taxonomies that are more public, so right now we're going through things that are um, very specific to internal uh, companies. But if you are using some terms that exist out in the world, whether you're using mesh or not, um, if you're using medical terminology, chances are mesh has something in there to help you. So that is another avenue that you can pursue if you want to uh, get some help in this mapping, mapping process. Done, we are going to do some testing. So when you did that machine learning, um, you, you can actually get a good feel for your test anyways to see how well your tagging matched up to old tagging, but that's the key, it's old tagging they, the, the company coming in or that content coming in might not really agree with the way they index things either. So one thing I have found really helpful is if they have any um, user analytics or download analytics or kind of click through analytics to know when a user searched on their interface for content, what term did they search on and then what did they click on? They don't necessarily have to buy it or download it, although those are more meaningful, by the way, so those would have like higher value for you. But knowing that a user typed in drone and then clicked on something about unmanned aerial vehicles is gonna really help you understand that those two things probably have something in common. And that's then going to help you when you're doing your mapping to understand, okay, I know the user thinks this is how it is, but the tags on the original content don't agree. That's okay because you actually have the really important data, which is users. What did they do with that information and how you, you can actually test your mapping to make sure that you're adhering to the user's expectations. Now it's time to actually code it.
So you can obviously be coding it into something this, this whole time. You saw in my little clips that I was using Excel. That was, again, primarily so I could have some other users come in and just like kind of eyeball what I was doing and get a feel for what it is, especially business owners. So some of those might be like Web Protege is a good example, Ace, uh, Neo4j, uh, and let's see, uh, Open Refine is also a good one that you can use. All of those are open and I've actually reviewed some of those on the channel. So I'll put links down below for those. And then there's also some tools that are not open where you would have to pay, um, although some of them do have open tiers if you wanna go and try those out. And some examples of that would be like Tiger Graph or Pool Party or like GraphDB. Uh, those all have capabilities where if you are mapping things in, um, like a hypergraph, you can absolutely use them that way. Now, if you're not using the hypergraph uh, way of doing things, that's fine too. And you can just use a regular relational database where you are basically just building a new vocabulary table that is the uh, super vocabulary that you would probably have after mapping these two things together. If you're going with a hypergraph or a graph solution, you may not actually need to go in and re-index your content uh, because basically what a hypergraph is going to do for you is because you're saying these terms and, and these uh, IDs specifically really mean this, this tag, this ID. So it's as if it's a translation between the different vocabularies and the tags in them. Uh, you do that at the search layer, right? Like that's the query expansion. So you don't really need to go back and re-index um, your, your archive or your backlog. Although if you want the user interface, um, if you can see those tags to be updated, you might want to do that, but that is usually time, uh, and money that you would have to spend on it. And if you're not using hypergraph, you absolutely are going to have to budget for going back in time and re-indexing all that content. So, uh, you know, is, are, is that still a viable option? Of course, a lot of people do it that way. However, I have lived through both scenarios and I will tell you at least personally, I would far rather have a hypergraph than have to re-index a whole lot of content because remember, it's not just re like updating the search index, it's using, updating all your machine learning and, you know, updating the, the labels and, and having to do the data migration before you do any of that. There's a lot of things that are involved with that. Now, if you are moving forward in time, you most likely need to add in training sets if you're doing automatic indexing for those new terms, if you did add any new terms from, from the incoming vocabulary. Um, and if you have any additional synonyms that came in, you also probably want to retrain. But retraining a model is not as difficult as creating a brand new model if you were still trying to represent both product lines. Because remember, this one is catalog level and classification level, which means you're gonna be really uh, confusing the machine because it's going to want to assign really broad and really specific all at the same time. So it's gonna get really tricky. All right, so with all of that said, I wish you the best of luck on your vocabulary mapping journey. This is something that I do a lot of. It happens all the time, whether it's new content coming in or you're partnering with a new company or maybe you're acquiring new companies like the other video. These are things that are very common in the control vocabulary space. And you can see that there's a lot of things in here too that the machine learning folks would have to keep in mind if they are going to be part of that acquisition or data integration. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.